Hey, what's up? And happy Mother's Day to all you moms out there. I hope you can find yourself um, enjoying this weekend with your family, even under these unusual circumstances. I just want you to know that we appreciate you and we're thankful for you, even in the middle of this craziness that we're living in. You know, the time that we're living in is a little uncertain, and the uncertainty can lead us into a period of like doubt and fear and worry. You know, I'm, and during this time, I'm reminded of a book that Louis Giglio wrote a few years ago entitled Goliath Must Fall. And in it, Pastor Louie looks through the lens of 1 Samuel chapter 17 and expounds on David's experience and the Israelites' experience with the, with the Philistines and Goliath and how the, the Israelites couldn't see how big their God was because of the giant that stood in front of them, the obstacle. And he begins to talk about our circumstantial, sometimes emotional, sometimes mental, sometimes physical, sometimes they might be even people in our lives that are giants that are in our way that are just dragging us down, that are defeating us, that are depriving us of our joy, that are wrecking our normalcy in our lives, that are bringing chaos into our lives. And it makes it really, really hard to trust God, to find the peace, to find the joy, because there's so much anxiety and fear and worry surrounding all of that maybe maybe it's a season right now that a few months ago everything was normal and now all of a sudden there is no normal anymore and we don't know when normal is going to come back to work maybe it's because of this you don't know when you'll get to go back to work you don't know if you'll have financial income to be able to take care of your family maybe it was outside of the realm of this whole pandemic and maybe it's a broken marriage it's it's stress on your relationship, it's kids fishing to go off to college, whatever the case may be, maybe at some point in time, maybe not even now, there has been or will be what we'll call a giant in our lives. Because let's just be real, life's hard, life isn't easy, and we have to deal with things like that. And as we begin to deal with things like that, we begin to question maybe, does God even care? Is God even listening to me? Is God really even for me? Is God moving around me? Is that true? 1 Kings chapter 18 is where we're going to be at today. And if you have a Bible or a phone or an app somewhere nearby, I invite you to turn with me there to 1 Kings chapter 18. As we try to unpack this idea that God really is bigger than the Goliath. And the Goliath must fall in our lives. For us to experience the freedom that God has for us, we must understand that there is no thing, there is no person, there is no situation that the sovereignty of God does not cover. You remember in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says, The wise man builds his house upon the rock. In the book of Psalms, uh, the psalmist writes 24 different accounts of God being our rock and our foundation. And in 1 Kings chapter 18, there's a situation. But before we get into the situation, let's backtrack to the beginning of the book of 1 Kings to figure out what in the world is going on. 1 Kings begins with Solomon transitioning to the throne. Remember, Solomon was the wisest king that has ever lived because he asked God for wisdom. Well, around 1 Kings chapter 11, before then, everything was going good. But in 1 Kings chapter 11, Solomon began to give way to his lust. And that lust began to turn into a downward spiral of bad decisions and put Israel in a bind. It divided the kingdom. It led to a civil, civil dispute. And then that turned into a series of kings that were just terrible and made terrible decisions and led the nation of Israel into disobedience. Then around 1 Kings chapter 16, a guy by the name of Ahab comes to the throne. The Bible says in 1 Kings chapter 16 that he was worse than any other of his predecessors. He was so evil. He did far more evil and far more evil than anybody else had it reigned before him. So 1 Kings chapter 17, God raises a guy by the name of Elijah to go pronounce God's judgment. He's a prophet. He goes to Ahab and pronounces a three-year drought on the nation of Israel because of Ahab's disobedience. Well, in 1 Kings chapter 18, God comes back to Elijah and says, Hey, go back. Let them know that the rain is coming. And during this confrontation, as Elijah goes back to King Ahab, here's what transpires. The nation of Israel has fallen into worship of false gods. If you know anything about the Old Testament, this is something that they're used to. They're always going back and forth between God and something. 
And so the prophets of Baal, Baal is the topic of discussion today, and God. So Elijah confronts Ahab, and Ahab says, well, God's not God, and the nation of Israel is saying God's not God. So Elijah says, let's settle it. Let's choose today who God is. Let's just prove it. Gather all the people together on the top of Mount Carmel, which is where our story picks up in verse 20 of 1 Kings chapter 18. And whichever God answers by fire, that's who we'll serve. What we'll do is we'll, we'll get a sacrifice. We'll build some type of altar. We'll light a fire. We'll, we'll build a wood and all those things. We won't light a fire. And we'll begin to pray. And whichever God comes through, that's God. If it's God, great. If it's Baal, great. But at least we'll know at the end of the day who God is. So I hope as we walk through this that we can see that God really is bigger than we think he is. That there really is hope, that there really is a sure foundation, that God can be trusted with whatever it is we're walking through, even in the middle of a national pandemic or even when just normal life happens, because life's kind of crazy too. So, we're going to start reading in verse 26. Uh, verse, yeah, verse 26. But if you're in the habit of taking notes, point number one I want to make is the emptiness of the world. The prophets of Baal have gathered together. Elijah says, hey, there's a bunch of y'all. Y'all go ahead and go first. And this is what happens. They build up their, their altar and... They took the bull that was given to them, they prepared it, and called upon the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, O Baal, answer us. But there was no voice, and no one answered. And they limped around the altar that they had made. And at noon Elijah mocked them, saying, Cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he is musing, or he is relieving himself, or he is on a journey, or perhaps he is asleep. And they cried aloud and cut themselves as after their custom with swords and lances until the blood gushed out upon them and as midday passed they raved on until the time of offering of the oblation but there was no voice and no one paid attention to me those latter verses in verse 29 is some of the saddest verses of scripture is they're crying out to their God their help their hope and no one answers no one comes back with any type of answer. Elijah even says, hey, maybe he's using the bathroom. Maybe he's out of the office. Hey, maybe you need to call and leave a voicemail. and Maybe he'll get back with you. Elijah's kind of poking fun at the prophets of Baal. But the reality is they are pouring out their efforts. They're dancing. They're spending all day exhausting themselves, literally cutting their flesh, hoping something would happen. The point I, I want to make here is that our lives are busy. Even in a normal setting, our lives are busy. We're, we're running to sports practice. We're running to work. We're running here. We're running there. We're, we're making sure we check the boxes of religion and making sure we go to church and we, we do the things we're supposed to do at church and we give and we do and we do and we do and now all of a sudden, all of that's gone. We're stuck at home. We're trying to figure out how to be the teacher, how to be the provider, how to be the dad, how to be the mom, how to be everything. All in a matter of just days, the normalcy of life was taken from us. And all of a sudden, we're left kind of empty-handed wondering, well, what do I do now? What's left? I think now more than ever we realize that nothing's guaranteed. And so we pour all of our efforts into whatever it is, whether it's making sure we're, we look good on the outside or making sure that we check all the boxes or making sure that we have the best careers and we have the nicest homes and we drive the nicest cars or making sure we make the right decisions, making sure our kids work the hardest, making sure they're the best athlete, making sure they have the best shot at life. For what? The prophets of Baal are slowly realizing that nothing can do nothing. None of those things that we just talked about that I just mentioned are bad. Having a good career, being successful, making sure your kids have the best interests, none of those are bad things. 
But what we find ourselves doing sometimes is we pour so much effort and attention to those things that we're left at the end of the day with all of that gone now. And it's like we have no purpose. We have no joy. We have no peace. We're literally driving ourselves stir crazy because we don't have any of that anymore. And God is saying, stop it. There's no purpose in that. This empty. This is not going to satisfy. I'm your purpose. I am your peace. Again, let me reiterate, none of those things are bad. But if we're not careful, we can allow ourselves to prioritize and pour all of this energy into something that matters, but in the long scheme of things, in the large picture of eternity, it doesn't really matter at all. We find ourselves, when Goliath comes, looking for an outlet. Can I just say, just because we're busy, it doesn't necessarily mean we're free. Instead of confronting Goliath with the truth of God, we begin to run from Goliath with the busyness of ourselves. It's empty. It can't stand. It isn't solid. They cry and they cry and they cry, and no one hears them, and no one answers. So, then what? Well, Elijah finally says, okay, it's my turn. So we pick up in verse 30. Elijah said to all the people, Come near to me. And all the people came near to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been thrown down. It was destroyed when the nation of Israel began to turn to Baal. Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be your name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench about the altar as the great as will contain two says of seed. And he put the wood in order and cut the bull in pieces and laid it on the wood. And he said, Fill four jars with water and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. And he said, Do it a second time. They did it a second time. He said, Do it a third time. They did it a third time. And the water ran around the altar and filled the trench also with water. So point number two. When faced with Goliath, when faced with giants in your life, begin with a heart of worship. The first thing that Elijah does is repair the altar of the Lord that was destroyed when, they, when the nation of Israel began to turn their hearts away. You see, we were created to be worshipers. We were created in the image of God. We were created to display God's image back to Himself, to just radiate His glory back to Him. Sin broke that and fractured that reflection. But this is what we were created to do. That's why the only joy that we find is in following Jesus. That's why the only purpose that we find is in following Jesus. Because that's what we were made to do. You think about it. If something's, you can't use a hammer to drill in a hole. You can't do it. You can use it to knock a hole out of the wall, but you can't use it to drill a screw in the wall. That's not what it was made to do. It has a purpose, just like you and I have a purpose. So we find purpose and we find joy at that point of exalting Jesus and saying, you know what, this is hard right now, but God, you are over all. This altar was a picture of redemption and praise and worship throughout the Old Testament. You think about it in Genesis chapter 8 when Noah gets off the ark. The first thing that Noah does is he builds an altar and reflects on God's deliverance. In Joshua chapter 8, the nation of Israel just had a massive military victory. And instead of celebrating their victory, they turn their hearts and reflect on what God has done. In the chaos of the world, in the craziness of the world that we live in, and the things and the busyness that we find ourselves caught up in, worship is a place where we can just push the pause button on life, redirect our hearts to our Maker, refocus our hearts on His Word, and reflect on the goodness of Him in the past. That's why we have His Word. We can go back through and we can skim through Scripture that oh, time and time and time and time again where Jesus is good and sovereign and over a situation to remind us that He doesn't change. If He has done it before, He can do it again. If He can move mountains, He can move mountains now. If He's done this, He can do that now. We have to find a place to just push pause, to sit down and maybe maybe right now when life has just kind of stopped for you, maybe this is the first time you really begin to experience that. 
because you finally slowed down enough to let all that saturate and the truth of God's Word saturate into your heart. The first response that we normally have is to go fight the battle. The first response that we normally have is go win the war, to figure out what the problem is and try to solve it. But no, God is telling us that's not what He's asking us to do. He's asking us to exalt Him, trust Him, follow Him that He is able. This is why Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that no matter what you do, you do it for the glory of God because that's what you were created to do. And even in the midst of the storm. So what happens after that? Elijah prays. Elijah prays in verse 36. O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant, that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have turned their hearts back. So Elijah just simply prays, God, I need you to move. God, turn the hearts of your people back. Then what happens the fire falls and consumes the burnt offering, the wood, the stones, the dust, and licked up the water that was in the trench. Remember, there's four jars of water, thir three jars of water on this offering. Everything's consumed. The only thing that Elijah asked was that God would move. He doesn't ask for specifics. He doesn't go into a big elaborate prayer. Not that there's anything wrong with that, with the right heart. But all he does is say, God, move. Here's my situation. God, move. So, number three, trust God can. Again, I find myself time after time when faced with an issue, with faced with a problem, with faced with my Goliath in life, I want to go fight him. I want to try to figure out how to solve the problem. I want to figure out how to make the right decisions. I want to figure out what to do. And time and time again, as soon as I get ready to go to battle, I find myself, just like the Israelites, greatly dismayed and afraid. Because I'm going to be a disappointment. I'm going to be a failure. I'm not going to win. I'm not good enough. I'm, I'm this. I'm that. God can't move, and I can't figure it out, and I'm not adequate enough to solve the problem or the issue that I'm facing. But that's not what God's asking of us. What God is asking of us is a life of full surrender to His sovereignty, a full surrender of trusting Him and trusting His ability to conquer anything in our lives. This is what is so beautiful about Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19. And what is the immeasurable greatness of His power towards us who believe, according to the working of His great might, that He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And He put all the everything, Every issue, every problem, every power, everything that you think is in control, God has put it all in the hands of Jesus under His authority. Think about that. Trust that God can. That no matter what chaos is forming around you, God's sovereignty is not defined by that chaos. Jesus is sitting on the throne with everything under control. In Ephesians chapter 3, this is what Paul says, This is the reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of His glory, He may grant you to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think 
according to the power at work within us, to Him be glory in the church and Christ Jesus throughout all generations. The picture is Jesus, victorious from the grave. See, I find myself fighting this battle of how to live life sometimes. Now what I mean by that is that I'm living my life for victory. I'm fighting each day for a good day. I'm fighting each day and each anxious moment for peace. I'm fighting each disappointment for satisfaction and approval. Instead of living my life from a place of victory where Jesus has already conquered death, has already approved of me because of His blood, has already chosen me because of His goodness, has already given me peace because He's conquered every issue that I have, who's already given me joy because He's satisfied, who's already given me purpose because of His grace. So because of all of that, He is able to do far more than I can ever ask or imagine. So whatever Goliath, whatever giant, whatever issue I find myself facing, God is good and God is sovereign over it. I think if we're honest, we have underpersonalized the gospel to a point where we think God just flat out doesn't care. Yeah, we, we think and we, we will say and we'll pray and we'll ask and we'll say God do this and God do that, but at the end of the day, I don't know that we walk away from those prayers leaving it at the throne room. I think we pick it up and take it with us and take the worry with us. I think we're like Acts chapter 12. The, Peter finds himself in prison in the early church or praying for his escape, for his freedom. A miraculous event happens, an earthquake, all this craziness. An angel of the Lord appears and leaves Peter literally right out the front gates of the prison unnoticed. Well, Peter comes to himself and he goes to the church. where there, He goes to the house where the church is praying. He knocks on the door and a servant girl comes to the door and realizes, recognizes Peter's voice, turns and runs back inside to tell the church, Peter's out, Peter's standing outside. Hey, look, our prayers have been answered. And the people inside praying look at the servant girl like she's crazy and says, what are you talking about? Peter's in prison. That's why we're all here praying for him to get out. And that's what our lives look like sometimes is God, okay, we trust you, but we really don't. We, we trust you with things that we know and that we can comprehend, but this uncertainty over here really freaks me out. And what God is saying to us is He is trustworthy with our chaos. He is trustworthy with our giant. He is trustworthy with our issues and our anxiety and our problems. He is over it. He is sovereign over all of it. He has defeated it on the cross. Took all of it for you. That's how personalized the gospel is. God is a good, good Father, God can rescue us from this craziness. God can rebuild your life. God can bring you back out of darkness. God can rebuild your marriage. God can bring stability in your life. God can provide for you. God can defeat your giant. Trust that. Trust that. Can I just say to you, that He is bigger than you think He is. That He is way ahead of wherever we are. He is standing at the other end of this already have won. So I wonder, during this time of craziness and during this time of uncertainty, can I ask you, are you broken? Can I ask you, are you empty? Can I ask you, are you fearful? Can I ask you, are you stressed out and anxious? And I don't ask you those things out of judgment because I'm just going to be honest with you, it scares me. It's uncertain times for me. It's uncharted waters for me as a husband and as an adult. Can I just say to you, 
God's got this thing. And it's all in His control. So here's what I want to ask you to do as we close our time together, as you are gathered around wherever you are right now, whether you're sitting on your couch or sitting outside, you're laying in the bed still, wherever you find yourself right now, can I just ask you to just open your heart and be real with God and in turn allow God to be real with you. It helps me sometimes to, to pray in a posture of just surrender. Me opening my life up and saying, God, here's all of my junk. Here's my giants. Here's what I'm struggling with. Here are my issues. And in that, laying that down and receiving God's goodness and His faithfulness to me and the truth that He says about me in His Word. And so in these next few moments, I'm going to pray. And can I ask you, as this video ends, and you go on, before you go on, before you get up, that you would just spend time at the feet of Jesus with your family, and you would just begin to pour out your heart to Him and receive His goodness to you. And may I remind you how the story ends. That, remember, there's a drought, right? God has just delivered. He's answered by fire then the rain comes. You see, there's a period of drought. There's a, there's a period of kind of uncertainty. There's a, there's a period of anxiety. There's a period of stress. But then the rain comes. There's victory in Jesus. And you have a good Father who loves you. Who cares for you regardless of wherever you find yourself. So can we pray together? Can we pray together right now? And I just ask that you just open your heart, not to me, but to the goodness of Jesus. Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for the victory that we have in the name of Jesus. God, we claim the truth right now in this moment that you have defeated our giants, that you are over every situation, that you are over every issue, that you are over every problem, that, God, you are victorious over every issue. God, your grace is enough. Your power is enough. God, you are enough. And, God, I pray that you would work, that you would use this time, God, to just change hearts. Make yourself known to us. And it's in your name alone, God, we pray. God, I love you. Amen.